Great to see you. Welcome and come on in. We're going to cover three things that will make you a better investor. And it doesn't matter if you're completely new to investing or the stock market. This video and channel is really for anyone who wants to put the time in to become more successful. And actually, the earlier you get started, the better off you'll be. And I bet the number one regret that every successful investor has is that they didn't start sooner. So here are the three things we're going to talk about today. Number one, we'll discuss whether investing in the stock market is worth it. Can you make money? Can you beat the professionals? What does it actually take? And then we'll take a look at the early days of some of the wealthiest hedge fund managers on the planet. And we'll talk about lessons that they learned early, early on in their careers. And then number three, we'll do a quick financial modeling tutorial that will allow you to see how stocks are priced. It's literally so simple to understand that you'll get it in less than a minute. But this powerful model is the basic building block that hedge funds and Wall Street analysts use to make their stock predictions. If you're coming back, thank you so much. It's great to see you again. I started putting up videos last week, and even though our community is small, it's so much fun to watch us grow bigger and bigger every day. It's exciting, and it's truly humbling, so thank you. If you're new, click the button here and subscribe to my channel today. When you subscribe, you're going to get notifications about my latest videos, and I'm also going to upload every single weekday. You're going to learn about investing and personal finance, and I hope we can all learn, grow, and become more and more successful together, whether you're just starting out or you have years of experience. Are you ready? Let's go. So part one, is it possible to beat the market? If you're playing for the long term, the answer is absolutely yes. You may have heard of the efficient market hypothesis, which basically says that the market accurately discounts all known information and it's reflected in the price. That is simply not true. Humans and even trading algorithms are fallible and they misprice things all the time. The market is not a perfect discounter of the future and you can take advantage of mispricings which occur literally every day in different stocks. So here's the deal. The system is set up for you to win. That is absolutely 100% true. This is not a casino where the odds aren't in your favor. The markets tend to go up over time. So if you're long, you will make money over the long term. You also have advantages over the institutions. You don't need to pay for trading costs anymore. You can go online and get access to so much research that wasn't available five or even 10 years ago. Here are the things that you need to do in order to think like a winner in the stock market. Number one, preserve capital. You need to win when you're right and avoid losses when you're wrong. If you're down 20%, you need to be up 25% just to make up your losses and get back to even. If you're down 50%, you need to be up 100% to get back to even. Look, this is hard, but most people give up before they win in the markets. So stay in the game. That is absolutely key. Be persistent, always learn, and always stay flexible. Stay humble with your wins and use every loss as a learning opportunity. Number two, follow your own path. The world's most successful investors all did things their own way. They found a way to win and they found a way to win consistently. What that means for you is that there is no one answer. If there were, then one person would make all of the money all the time. And that's never happened before in the history of the markets. So people are always developing new ways, new strategies, and testing different things on how to be successful and how to make money in the markets. And by the way, those rules change all of the time. So there is no perfect investment strategy. The perfect investment strategy is one that fits your own style. Whether you're a technical trader, whether you look at the short term, at the long term, whether you're a fundamental investor, a value investor, it doesn't matter. You simply need to find trades that have a good risk reward, i.e. if you're right, you're going to make more than you lose when you're wrong. Before we get to the financial modeling, let's take a look at number two, a few of the most successful hedge fund managers. One of my favorites is Stan Druckenmiller, a macro trader. Apparently his net worth is $4.6 billion. He started his firm with a million dollars under management in 1981. And that AUM generated $10,000 in fees, which isn't very much considering that his overhead was $110,000. He did well his first year, but he was in a deficit in terms of his operating budget. And so he took all of the firm's capital, which was $50,000. And in an effort to save the firm, he bought T-bill futures, which ended up generating a negative net worth for the firm of $40,000. So he was in the hole when he first started his firm. He went on to compound money at 30% for 30 years. If you put $1,000 into his fund, you would be walking away with over $2.6 million by the time he finished. Paul Tudor Jones is another one of my favorites. I just want to spend one second talking about his very first trading experiences. 
He talked about this in an interview at Goldman Sachs with Lloyd Blankfein, where he said he had two phenomenal learning periods early on in his career where he lost everything. In one instance, $10,000 went to zero, and then he took another $20,000 after that and lost that all too. This was in 1978 or 1979. He started his firm a few years later, but his most formative experiences related to early losses that he had. After he formalized his investment process and really started focusing on protecting the downside, his business took off and he now has a net worth of $5.1 billion. Finally, Bruce Kovner, who founded Caxton Associates. He has a net worth of $5.3 billion, but one of the jobs that he took before he started his fund was as a cab driver. So to anyone who's driving an Uber or a Lyft right now and has aspirations to go on and do bigger and better things, there's all the inspiration you need right there. Number three, financial modeling. I will leave a link to this data in the description, but the big takeaway from this chart is that the market follows the earnings of the market's constituent companies if you look at a chart over the long term. So the market's made up of companies, okay? And let's say we have a lemonade stand, um, and the lemonade stand earns $1,000 a year. So you have some costs that you're gonna have, maybe let's say 60% of the sales you have to spend on sugar and lemons, okay? We have DNA, which stands for depreciation and amortization, which is a non-cash cost. And just to explain what that means, Suppose you need wood and nails and things like that to build the actual uh, stand. If the stand costs you $750, but it lasts you for 10 years, you can expense that cost up front. But in order to smooth out your earnings, really for accounting purposes and tax purposes, you get to expense one tenth of that cost each year. Let's say you spend $200 on an employee it means your operating income is $125. If you pay 20% in taxes, you arrive at a net income of $100. Every company in the stock market has an outstanding share count, which represents the number of shares that the company is capitalized with. You'll notice sometimes that there are common and diluted shares. We don't need to cover that right now, although it is important. Let's assume that our lemonade stand was capitalized with 50 shares. It means that our $100 of net income translates into $2 of earnings per share. And that's the same for any company in the stock market, uh, just like Apple or any other business. They all have an earnings per share number. By the way, sometimes it's negative for a biotech company or maybe an energy company that's not earning current profits. EPS may be negative. Their expenses may be greater than their revenue or they may not be making revenue at all. But over the very long term, as we saw with that chart, Every company is always priced on the basis of future expectations concerning the cash flow of a business, and that is without exception. Over the long term, that is the way things work. So if we take an NPV of that $100 earning stream, that $100 annual earning stream, the net present value, if we discount the cash flows at 10%, is 1000 bucks. Okay, so what does that mean? The very simple idea, and this, is, this drives 90 to 95% of all finance. The idea is, is that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. If somebody wanted to borrow 100 bucks from you and they told you they'd pay you back tomorrow, you might say fine and give them, a, give them the 100 bucks. If they said, hey, I want to borrow 100 bucks from you and I'll pay you back in 20 years, well, you may not lend to them, or if you did, you'd want a whole lot more than $100 back. So that drives the idea of an interest rate. Basically, what am I charging for the money that I lend? And if I can lend my money out somewhere else, I may not give it to a company or to a borrower. So we always have to discount future cash flows by the amount that the capital providers are willing to accept as a return on their money. I'm going to breeze over how I got to the 10% discount rate, but just know that a good rule of thumb is around 8 to 12%, and the direction of interest rates are what drive discount rates. So as an interesting sidebar, all else being equal, if interest rates go up, the value of a company should go down because your interest rates increase. Does that make sense? So here my NPV of the future cash flows is $1,000 based on a 10% discount rate. If I increase this to 12, the value goes down, and that makes sense, right? You're discounting the future values by more. Okay, on a per share basis, my NPV is $20. 
And we already said that my current year earnings is $2 per share. If the stock were trading at its NPV, that would equate to a PE of 10 times. And by the way, somebody like Warren Buffett probably wouldn't buy this stock because the value of the future cash flows are currently reflected in the stock price. It's not necessarily a great deal. But let's see what happens if we increase the revenue growth to 5%, okay? So the NPV almost doubled because now we have some real growth. And you can see because I've held the operating expenses fixed as a percentage of revenue that the earnings growth will be equivalent to the revenue growth in each year. So this should be 5%. Let's just make sure. Yeah, so the growth is 5% each year. Look at what happened to my NPV though. It basically doubled and the NPV is now $40 per share. Okay, so the PE has gone up to 19.8, which is essentially where the S&P is right now. But let's say I get to buy the stock for that original value of 20. Okay, my entry price or my PE based on current earnings is still 10 times, but my price based on, let's say three years out when we're earning 221 is 9.1 times. So the stock is actually getting cheaper as the earnings grow or said a different way. If I believe there's revenue growth of 5%, then I should believe in an NPV of $2,000 or almost $40 per share. If the market is discounting zero growth and the market believes the stock is worth 20, I can make a lot of money by buying a 20 or a $40 bill for 20 bucks. Does that make sense? That's literally all Warren Buffett does. So that's about all for this video. I know we covered a lot of things quickly and maybe to some of the more experienced people, this is old hat and you totally already get it. Um, maybe I was too descriptive, maybe not descriptive enough. Just leave me a comment and let me know so I can get better and better and help more and more people. And by the way, this is helpful for me too because it allows me to clarify my thinking. So thank you so much. And hey, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Make sure you hit the button below and turn on the bell. And just a quick uh, thing, I wanted to provide some resources for free because I said that uh, it's a great time to be an individual investor. So I will leave the links to each of these four websites in my uh, description. But number one, Yahoo Finance. I can go and take a look at Apple. I can see what their average EPS estimate is for this year, 2020, and also next year. I can go create my own model and see if my earnings estimates differ from the consensus. And on that basis, potentially make an investment in the stock that will yield me money. So this is a great resource. It's Yahoo Finance. The next one is Market Screener. And I really like Market Screener because if you notice, they will give you uh, EBITDA estimates as well, which Yahoo Finance does not. We didn't cover EBITDA in this video, but if you add our operating earnings together with depreciation and amortization, you have EBITDA. I'll cover that in another video. Next is Finviz, and I really like Finviz because, again, it's free, and it shows you the most recent analyst upgrades and downgrades for a stock, as well as their price target. And finally, you can use Y charts as well. Full disclosure, I'm a subscriber, but... I'm not affiliated with them at all. They're not paying me to say any of this stuff. I think it's a pretty good program. There are some things that could be improved upon, but you can also use some of their features for free, and I recommend checking it out. Thank you so much, and I'll see you soon.